That was great. I'm impressed with myself. <laughs> and truth be told, I was, um, I did spend my first 20 years of my career in advertising and after owning my own firm for 14 years, it started, I started to say, this isn't fun anymore. Uh, I better start to think about something else. And um, it was the year after 9-11, and a few of you, you have heard this story before. Um, many of us were questioning what can we do in the world to make it a better place. And a few business women came together and said, there must be a role for business in peace building. And I was actually involved in BPs from the beginning as a volunteer and still running my business. And one day, um, two people on my staff quit very unprofessionally. I said, that's it, I'm out of here. And it took me 14 months to downshift my business and I decided to um, basically lead BPs full time as uh, pro bono, so, uh, and that's what I've done since BPs was founded in 2004 and I downshifted my business by 2005. And, um, so that's the, the real secret story. I just wanted the fun, you know. <laughs> um, so what I'd like to do today is to start in a broad context, uh, be peace in our work, and narrow it down uh, to those soccer balls in Afghanistan as an example of what we do, and then broaden it out uh, on a few lessons learned. Is that okay with you guys? We'll have Q&A after. Um, so you'll probably have a lot of questions about Afghanistan, so I won't really cover the culture or anything in my, my talk. Um, you can ask uh, about it later. Yes, I have been there. I've been there five times. Um, and let's just say I'm happy to arrive and I'm happy to leave. <laughs> um, so when BP is founded, uh, we really didn't know how to figure out what role business could play in peace building. We, we, we had to figure it out. What we did know um, is we wanted to go along a different path than other nonprofits have gone and focus ourselves on outcomes, not on activities. Not saying, oh, look, we trained 1,000 women. Oh, what happens after those women are trained? Okay. So once we started to think about outcomes, we realized what, is, what are the tipping points in these conflict-affected communities that could prevent the recurrence of violence? Jobs. And I went through the dot-com era in New York City in the late 1990s when my firm had more business. We had to turn away business. If you could breathe in New York City, you could get a job. The unemployment rate was at an all-time low. So was the crime rate. Didn't take a brain surgeon to figure out more jobs, less violence. Okay. Now, I can't prove that. I can't, there's, no, there's no academic research out there that's going to prove that to you, that if we create more jobs in Afghanistan, there's going to be less violence. That if we create more jobs in Rwanda, there's not going to be another genocide. That if we create more jobs in El Salvador, it's going to decrease gang violence. I can't prove that to you. But there's a lot of things we believe in that we can't prove. I've got a lot of like-minded people who believe that. 260 business professionals in the U.S. who volunteer their time as BPs members believe in that. We have nine Afghans in the U.S. right now. Uh, they arrived on Saturday apprenticing on the job at host companies in the U.S. They're apprenticing at 40 host companies, including Microsoft, including Cargill, including PricewaterhouseCoopers. They believe in that. We have donors, grassroots donors, people who give us $10, people who give us $5,000. They believe in that. It's just intuitive that when you help people help themselves, provide them the skills, people do want to be self-sufficient. And when they have a steady income, they can send their kids to school, they can put better nutrition on the table or on the floor wherever they eat. 
Education is the bridge to everything, better understanding, and they start to acquire things. And when they start to acquire, they don't want to lose those things, right? So they have something to lose, they don't want their community in violence. From the very beginning, we also had a bias for women entrepreneurs. And in the beginning, the early years, we only worked with women entrepreneurs. Because our, again, our belief was that if women had a, stronger, had a stronger economic voice, they would have a stronger voice for peace in their community. Now, I can't say we were the early adapters. We were talking about this sooner than anyone else. Now you have Nike, the girl effect, and there are a lot of programs focused on women's, women business owners. But I can tell you we were the first to talk about jobs, and others have followed. So in the broader context, we look for not startup businesses in these conflict-affected areas. We look at s small business owners already in business, because we're investing our time. And yes, we do have staff on the ground in the, these three countries that I mentioned, and we have staff in New York. But we have 260 of these volunteers who are investing their time, and when they go to these regions, these volunteers are paying their own way. They're taking their vacations, they're taking time off from work, paying their airfare and the hotel to go. That's a lot of investment. We value the, the time of these volunteers, these business volunteers, and everything they give us in terms of travel, and that amounts to more than $500,000 a year. So that's a big investment. We want to make sure we're choosing wisely, and that's very difficult. So we've learned not to work with startup businesses. Let, some, let that be on somebody else's dime. Train them how to open a business. We intercept them when they've been in business at least a year and are making payroll of at least five employees, right? Now when you gotta worry about keeping those jobs for employees, it's a whole different game with a small business owner. How many of you are small business owners? Okay, right. How many of you have employees? Right, a whole different game, you know, when you're worried not just about yourself, but about somebody else. So we also wanted to look at these small business owners. We had, again, a bias for women, but we soon came to accept men into the program who employed women, who bought from women vendors, who, or who were providing services to women. Because why should we turn away a man who could create 100 jobs for women? We also wanted to make sure that they were in industry sectors that were scalable that would grow. So if somebody's making a product with not a lot of market opportunity, you know, that's what, not what we're interested in. We measure our outcomes on the number of jobs created every year. We measure our outcomes on the number of businesses that are still in business. We measure our outcomes on how profitable they are, um, is their profit margin going up? We measure our, our outcomes on what percentage of their vendors are local, so we can measure the amount of money circulating in the local community. And we measure our outcomes on what percentage of those vendors are women. We measure our outcomes on what skills are they training their employees in. We measure our outcomes on if those skills are translatable or transferable to other businesses so that now those employees have some human capital, they have some different capital to trade. We measure our outcomes based on the involvement of these small business owners in the economics of their communities. Are they helping others? Are they involved in helping officials get elected? We measure on our outcomes on are they paying taxes, right? That's important to these countries to grow. Um, we, so there's a lot that we measure. It's all about outcomes. It's not about activities. We force them to choose what services they want from us. BPs is, is constructed like a pro bono consulting firm, right? It's, 
I come from, most recently, from a consulting background, so it's no surprise we structured BP like a consulting firm. There's the Afghanistan team, the El Salvador team, the Rwanda team. There's the Dosti Soccer Ball Working Group. There is the, um, the Diaspora, El Salvador Diaspora Working Group, looking to get more um, people of Salvadoran descent in the U.S. involved with us. So we break it down into groups. And then for each of these, especially for El Salvador fast runners, there's actually a consulting team map to them. So for La Canasta, which is a food processing company in San Salvador, and they produce um, fruit juice, dried fruit juice mixes made from fruit. So you just mix these with water, but very esoteric fruits that I've never heard of. Um, that team consists of a U.S. food processing expert, a U.S. Uh, financial restructuring expert because their cash flow is nothing because they're so heavily, they've, they've not managed their debt wisely. Um, we have a retail expert, actually an employee of Walmart, who is a volunteer with us on her own. So these corporations don't join us as members. Individuals at these corporations join us as members. So we have an employee of Walmart who's advising La Canasta on how to improve their position with Walmart. And our staff on the ground, Ana Rosa Selva, will work with these La Canasta and our other El Salvador fast runners on a day-to-day -day basis, just like any consultant would. And we had two what we call traveling mentors go down to La Canasta, uh, Janice Grover, who's a food processing uh, professional, and Laura Rada, who is our finance restructuring. They went down to El Salvador in September and worked for a week with Las Canasta on these issues. And then they leave, and so that BP doesn't fall into the trap, as many other nonprofits do, of hit and run, Ana Rosa is there on the ground to make sure there's follow through on everything else that occurred. In, that's El Salvador where the businesses are larger, they could be million dollar businesses. Uh, but they're still categorized in El Salvador as small businesses. In, in Afghanistan and Rwanda, um, small business owners actually apply to our program. And there's not such a robust consulting team mapped to them because that's not what their mentality is there. So our ground staff in those countries are very important to keeping the program going day to day and reaching back into the BP's mothership in U.S to get the kind of help that the fast runners need. It could be anything from they need a logo, it could be that they need tweaks on their business plan so they can apply for some loans. Um, it could be, and the big thing on the Dosti soccer balls was pricing the balls. You know, not just picking a number out of the air, but figuring out how to price the balls and make a profit so these operations were sustainable. So BP's born out of uh, emotion, structured like a business, structured like a consulting firm, with clients, not beneficiaries. You know, they don't want to be called clients, but they are. You got to make sure they're satisfied with us because we invite them into the program for three years and we don't want to lose them during those three years because we want to measure those jobs every year, right? Because we want to measure those outcomes. So, that brings you down to, let's talk about Afghanistan, which is probably, not that the other countries aren't interesting, um, but Afghanistan is very interesting to talk about. When we first went, BPs went there in 2004 for the first time, and there were a group of eight volunteers who went. I was on that first trip. I was on it with my husband, who's a retired attorney. Um, I can't even tell you the preparations that went on. We had a half hour phone call one day on what we were going to wear for fear that our ankles, for the women, that our ankles would show getting out of the van and some, somebody would get incensed and like fire upon us, right? Uh, so we arrived in Afghanistan, the women in the group, with, I can only explain, chaparella clothes. I mean, really just 
covered up to here and down to there and loose and baggy. We were the worst dressed women in Afghanistan. <laughs> you know? And even if a woman is wearing a burqa, she's got high heels and a stylish handbag, and you know, because that's the way she shows that is she's a woman. Um, so everybody said when we went in 2004 that we would not find Afghan businesswomen. And we said, ah, no, we're from New York, we'll find them. Um, <laughs> and uh, now I should say that 60% um, of BP's member volunteers are in the New York tri-state area, but we have members from 27 states now. So um, BP's is catching. <laughs> and Germany, and Canada, and the UK, too. Um, so, but the business women we found in 2004 were basically in the handicraft business. Uh, and so we did help them. Those are the businesses that we found, and they, were, they had been operating covertly under the Taliban. Um, and they were women of a certain age who were operating those businesses because they had children to feed and they had to survive. And quite a few of them were widows. So they really didn't care as much as other people thought. And so they took those steps. And they were the most extraordinary women. You can never, ever, ever think of them as victims. Um, and the, um, there's a book out by one of our members called The Dressmaker of, I'm never gonna say the name right, Connor Carter. Uh, but it's about one of these fast runner women. It's a great read uh, by Gail Lemon. Uh, and it talks about what life and business was like under the tan of Taliban for these women. So you can never think of them as victims. They are simply magnificent, smart, intuitive businesswomen. BP's program director, Marla Gitterman, uh, used to work at Women's World Banking and has worked in 20 different countries. And she said, there is no culture more entrepreneurial than the Afghans. So that's what you don't read about in the paper, but that's something to understand. So we worked with these women, and um, it was incredibly fun it, and productive. And in 2004, Afghanistan was unbelievably at peace compared to what it is now. I mean, I can remember rolling into Kabul. It was sunny, it was beautiful, it was very dusty. Um, but we didn't really have to worry about our safety. You know, it was just a matter of not offending somebody culturally, like not holding hands with my husband on the street or something. But it was, it was great and, um, and very welcoming. The Afghans are always very welcoming and very hospitable and family is always, always comes first. We could learn a lot from them as a culture in terms of how they value family. So we worked with those group of women who are mostly, as I said, in the handicraft business through our three, three years, the highlight of our work with them was bringing them to the U.S. for two weeks to apprentice at the Fashion Institute of Technology so they could learn about color and fabric and materials and fit. And they'd really been isolated from that during all those war years. Now remember, before the Russians invaded Afghanistan, you're looking back in the, the 60s, Afghan women were wearing mini skirts and going to college. So these pictures you see today are not, Afghanistan was not always like that. And then there came the war and then there came the Taliban and um, the marginalization of, of women. Um, so I remember one woman um, in our program, I'm gonna say Hosai, but that was not her name, talked to me about jogging in the streets of Kabul with her husband you know, pre-war. Um, so again, I want to change this idea of that we might have of Afghan women. So we were successful with that group. We created jobs. Many of those businesses are still in business today. We helped set up, everything is about family and family, uh, it's very unusual to partner with people in business outside of the family. And so, you're laughing. <laughs> uh, and we helped do something revolutionary, we thought, at the request of the Afghan women. We helped 10 unrelated Afghan women start their own retail shop in Kabul. And it was hard. And is Marsha here? 
Uh, okay, so there's actually somebody here in Little Rock, Marsha Metzenberg Dyer, and her sister Pam Metzenberg, which is how I come to be here, um, who knows Julie, um, helped actually set up that shop and cobble. Everything from choosing the paint that went on the walls, to merchandising the shop, to pricing the products. So that was revolutionary. Is this shop still there? Yes. Is it flourishing? It's still there, though. So that's something. Um, so we decided our next group of fast runners, we would focus on non-traditional industries. Because again, there are a lot of other nonprofits there focused on handicraft. And those businesses aren't scalable. And they're not going to create a lot of employees. They'll create a lot of work, but they're not a lot of employees. So our second group, we, we recruited a commercial printer, a female commercial printer, a female furniture maker, uh, a female radio broadcaster. You get the gist. And our model was the same. We provided on the ground consulting. We'd bring them to the US to apprentice on the job at US firms. And we'd send them back and continue with the on the ground consulting and access to US ex experts. This particular group now that's in the US, as I said, includes men. We have um, a young man who has a web design firm, a female IT specialist who's at Microsoft today in Seattle, um, Rasul, who owns a radio station in Mazar that's aimed at farmers, and he's on his way to Kansas next week to apprentice at a WFRM in Clay City, Kansas, which specializes to farmers. Um, Zarhuna, uh, I might have mentioned to you, she owns four beauty salons in Afghanistan, she employs 65 women. Her business was a $100,000 business last year. And she's at Bumble and Bumble uh, today in the New York City. And she should be in the uh, Wall Street Journal tomorrow. So this gives you an, uh, an example of how we've progressed from a woman who was embroidering a tunic to uh, more non-traditional businesses. So soccer balls. Um, Taj and Aziza were two women who entered, who applied to our program back in 2008. They were independently had separate companies producing soccer balls, mainly being ordered by uh, USAID and other international aid organizations who hired them to make balls with promo slogans like don't do drugs and we can all live in peace. And we said, that's great, and you're making a nice living, but guess what? They're eventually going to leave. They're going to eventually hightail it out of there, and you're going to have a couple of hundred women with nothing to do, right? So we said, you need to have, have an export market for these balls. And so the design on the ball was actually created by a business in New York, Lee Dog. Again, Taj and Aziza were clients. They listened to what they wanted on the ball. They created the ball. They, they presented several options to them. They chose the design. The women chose the name, Dosti, which means friendship. We helped them improve, improve the quality of the balls, everything from a consistent weight to size. And then we had to real, this real struggle was on pricing. As I explained to a smaller group last night, um, you know, Afghanistan is an import economy. So the synthetic leather needs to come in from Pakistan, which is really coming from Japan or sometimes South Korea. The bladder comes in from Pakistan. All this adds to the cost. Uh, the inks come from Pakistan to silkscreen. Sometimes they even send the designs to Pakistan for, um, to create the film for silkscreening. Um, so when you, all is said and done, and accounting for a profit, you've got a $12 ball. Now you have to get them into this country, and DHL is the only game in town. So that's another six or eight dollars. So you're, you know, landed in here, it's eighteen dollars before you even do anything. So our role right now is to try to create a US market for these balls. They are online. We also want to privatize this initiative within the next year and get BPs out of the soccer ball business. We've set up everything. The women know how to work with pri purchase orders, they know pricing, they know everything, and turn it over to somebody who wants to make a business out of this in the U.S. And they could make a very good business. Not with a ball that's going to compete with Nike or Adidas, but that it's a ball with a story that is a high-quality ball. Um, and they'll, 
everybody's going to say, how can I get these balls? We well, can go online and pay $55 at globalgoods.org, globalgoodspartners.org, or if you want to make a donation later on to BP, so $30 or more, we'll give you what we have. I don't want to leave here with any balls, so I don't want to carry them back. Um, it all, you know, and those soccer balls are a great example of trade, not aid. Taj and Aziza employ more than 450 illiterate women who would never, uh, who don't have any other skills. The only other job they could possibly get is a house cleaner, but they have no way of getting there. You know, they have no mass transportation. They, there is child care in terms of the extended family. Um, these soccer balls allow them to stitch these balls in the home while they're still taking care of the kids. They can do it during the day or they can do it at night when the kids go to bed. It's a flexible schedule. If they can stitch two balls a day or about 40 or 50 a month, they can earn enough to support their family for a year. And what they earn actually compares with a civil servant salary in Afghanistan without the transportation or the child care issues. And importantly, it's what this ball does. Um, these women can send their kids to school. And I thought it was, and I explained last night, was because they could afford the kids' stationery or uniforms. That's not the case. The kids are sent out into the streets to earn income. It could be from begging. It could be from fetching water. There's no running water in many Afghan homes. There's like pumps on the street. The kids have to lug it back or to run errands for people in the neighborhood. But when a steady income is coming into the home from these soccer balls, moms don't have to do that to the kids. And they can say to the kids, go to school because it's all right. We can, we can sacrifice that income now. The other things that these balls give is, is confidence and self-worth to the women are earning this income. Um, we'd like to see it expand to uh, other provinces where women don't have economic opportunity. And it's also creating change in the U.S. So a um, Orange County Community Foundation in California bought 400 of the balls and gave it to three nonprofits that work with kids. Those nonprofits gave the balls to the kids after they cleaned community parks. So those balls send Afghan kids to school and clean up parks in California. And that's pretty cool, and it makes me really happy. And thank you for having me. Thank you, Tony. We do have time for some questions. If you raise your hand, we'll get a microphone to you. Yes, ma'am, one second. When you were, when you were talking about outputs um, or outcomes, what about, um, is one of those um, improving or uh, ensuring um, good working conditions for the women? Um, or is, is that a consideration? No. <laughs> um, you know, I wish to say yes, we go in and, and do that, but we're really focused on access to markets, business expansion, uh, and Afghanistan has so many other concerns. Yeah, yeah, maybe eventually, but honestly, no now, not now, no. Uh, did you run into the uh, three cups of tea kind of system and do New Yorkers enjoy a slower pace over in Afghanistan? Do you know what I'm talking about? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, we're New Yorkers when we go into Afghanistan or we're Pennsylvanians when we go in Afghanistan or we're Connecticut people. No, we get there, we have a schedule, we're like, no, we don't enjoy that slow place. We're going, come on, come on, come on, we got to go. You know, we're there for a limited amount of time, and we spent a lot of time and money to get there, and we want to we keep the trains running. We want to accomplish what we want to accomplish. They think we're nuts. I mean, we, we, they, they, the first thing they said to me when they arrived on set Saturdays, I know, Tony, zoot, zoot. <laughs> and what does zoot, zoot mean? Come on, hurry up, we got to go. <laughs> so, no, we don't, no. We try to pack in as much as we can. In the back seat. Hi, thank you. Uh, just wondering a little bit about how you match your 
volunteers, consultants with the businesses. For example, La Canasta has somebody who's working with Walmart, yet they also have a business relationship. How do you, one, delineate that line uh, to ensure that there's, there's no crossover at the same time they're receiving the help that they need from the business professional? So um, what we do is, you know, as I said, business people join us as individuals, not through their companies. And they are smart enough to establish that line themselves. So for instance, uh, Jennifer, who works for Walmart, has access to documents that tutor Walmart vendors on certain business practices. Those are public documents. Now, we could scrounge around and eventually find them, but she makes it easy for us to get that. So she's not giving us anything that's proprietary um, at all. Um, so that's how that works. How we match them up, it, anybody here in the real estate business? Anybody here look for a house recently, right? So you're looking for a house, it's got to depend on what inventory is out there. Is your dream house out there? So a lot of it is, you know, is a waiting game. We, we have a volunteer who's looking to do something, but we don't have the right matchup. Sometimes it's a direct translation. So. Uh, somebody who is in food processing and we have a food processor entrepreneur or sometimes it's a mutation we will say to someone hey I see that you do business communications training for Morgan Stanley could you help this entrepreneur with messaging on how to position their business so we kind of stretch it but the other thing is what's really happening now is especially for El Salvador we're getting a lot of businesses in which we have no experience or we don't have a membership, uh, any members with that experience. So we go into LinkedIn to look for that. So we go into LinkedIn and say, we need to find somebody with injection plastic mold experience. Um, and so it's become very important to us, on st the people on staff, to be linked into our members, all 260 members, so we can mine their contacts and ask for an, an introduction. And that has become, that we've gotten a big payoff from that. Um, and uh, it was somebody at a IBM HR who gave us the, the quick training and how to really do that effectively. Hello. <clears throat> I was just wondering how you choose the countries that you have the projects in. For example, um, I worked as a volunteer nurse in St. Lucia in the West Indies and got to know um, number of families there, very bright women who, you know, it's very, very high unemployment. And there are some factories that have been run by people from Taiwan where they were making like Mickey Mouse toys and, you know, souvenirs for very little money. But it seems like it would be a prime place. I was wondering, is there any chance you can do something there? <laughs> <laughs> well, the first thing is uh, conflict affected. So is it a conflict affected, affected area? And can jobs help prevent the recurrence of violence there? So if it's a political conflict, jobs aren't going to do much. So we looked at Tibet, that's not go jobs are not going to help. So that's the first criteria. And then we have about 40 other criteria, everything from do our members want to travel there to is there funding? We do need money to do our work to how long is it to get there? I mean, Afghanistan really is like, please. I'm getting too old for this, you know. <laughs> but it's a long haul, and it's a long haul for them to come over here. So there are a lot of different, both data-driven uh, and soft issues that we look at to choose. On the, what we're looking at right now is Haiti, but we're not sure the nature of, what is the nature of the conflict there, if any, other than, you know, crime and street violence, and Egypt. And Egypt is attractive to us because it's a Muslim-majority country, and we have experience with an Afghanistan, a Muslim majority country, so. Sir, did you just have a question? I hope I didn't say anything you didn't agree with over there. <laughs> no, I, I totally agree. Um, as far as carpets, and carpets is one of the main, uh, or used to be one of the main export of Afghanistan. Unfortunately, now it's opium. but. <laughs> Um, is your uh, BP in any way, uh, shape, or form connected with any uh, carpet businesses in Afghanistan? No. Um, we made a decision very early on not to be. Um, and 
we really felt that that was at the micro level and it's, uh, it's providing families with income. But we have a sister organization called ARZU, A-R-Z-U, headed by an ex-Goldman uh, Sachs executive, Connie Duckworth. And she has done really fabulous work with families and carpets. And one of the things that she has done, because children, um, you know, a carpet loom will be in the home, and everybody works on it, especially the children. And she has paid a premium to families who send their children, who can prove that they're sending their children to school. So if she will buy carpets from that, those families. She's also introduced more modern designs, um, because what was happening before is that the Afghans would work on um, carpets and traders from Pakistan would come in, buy them, bring them to Pakistan to clean them, shave them and clean them, and then export them as products of Pakistan, and they'd be making the money, not the Afghans. So um, Connie Duckworth, Arzu, great organization, award-winning organization. She's done fine work in that area, so we don't need to. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, you mentioned bringing Afghans to the United States to work with businesses. I was just wondering sort of about the logistics of that in terms of getting visas. Was it difficult having them here with the language barrier and cultural barriers? And are they actually going back to Afghanistan? I hope so. <laughs> um, so visa issues, if we start, takes us about four months. Now, the State Department partially funds our work in Afghanistan, so that makes it somewhat easier for us uh, and that we know these people. And so the visa process is very lengthy. In fact, uh, Masuda, who was supposed to be with me today, who is a partner in the Sokoval Project, didn't get her visa till three days later than uh, she was supposed to leave. So she only arrived in the U.S. yesterday, and I really didn't have the heart to put her on a plane to come down here after traveling for three days. So, so, the, uh, so the visa process is, is a problem. The logistics, well, as entrepreneurs start to trend younger, their English skills, their computer skills are very good, and their English skills are pretty good. So um, in the early days, we had to have an interpreter 24-7, not so much anymore. And, you know, they, they're on Facebook. You know, they, they know how to tweet. Um, you, I got an email this morning from one of our members saying that she took Masuda and Mo Sabir, who uh, fabricates metal security gates, and Zarguna, our beauty salon lady, out to dinner. And Kathy, our volunteer, was trying to do something on BlackBerry and sort of like was complaining it's so slow. And uh, Masuda goes, oh, I thought that was just in Kabul it was slow. So yeah, the logistics, um, some of the things we still have to worry about, uh, they really don't like American food at all. <laughs> they don't, first of all, don't talk to them about business at a meal, please. This is a meal, it's a social event, like don't talk to me about business. They don't want, they don't understand these cold sandwich lunches, like what is this, you know? Um, and they don't like anything spicy, right? <laughs> um, so, you know, what the lead of American food or, and the very uh, uh, concerned that their meat won't be halal, right? So uh, what we have to do is make them smart about what is pork so that they don't inadvertently eat pork. And any of their host companies, we have to say, please help them recognize pork, like no hot dogs, bacon, and all that kind of stuff. Um, and they'll eat you know, pizza and Indian food if it's not spicy, and Chinese food. And they like a home-cooked meal. But the most diff and, and then we give advice to the host companies Please don't take a photograph of any of the women unless she has her scarf on. Even if she's walking around your plant with it, with it off, when it comes to photographs, please make sure it's on. Please don't try to kiss any of the Afghan women and embrace her. You know, let her extend her hand. Please don't take any photographs of the Afghan women unless she gives her permission. So those, it's food and photos of the women that we, the most pain in the neck. Not pain in the neck. That's you know we've just learned. I mean this is we want them to have a great experience and not worry about this stuff. So we have time for one more. Hi, my name is Christine. I'm a first year student here at the Clinton School. Um, you mentioned that you'll work with the company for three years. Do you see? Um, do you keep track of their progress? Do you see any mentoring relationships where they use the skills that they've 
garnered working with you and trying to actually transfer them, continuing them in their communities? Um, you know, we, we like to keep on measuring them after they exit the program, and one of the ways we do that is to have a little party about in just around November, so when the census comes around in January, they're sort of prepped for that. We don't do mentoring in the traditional sense. We may change that, but here's why. Um, in the mentoring one-to-one, -one, uh, a U.S. business person to an Afghan person, the language and technology platform was not there. They didn't have the bandwidth of technology, and neither side had the English skills. So that became an issue for us, and we, we just put that aside. Instead, we came up with something called an advocate model, where a U.S. person could be an advocate for an Afghan. So actually, the advocate for Masuda on these soccer balls is, um, you have dress barn down here? OK. Uh, a retired HR, uh, the top HR guy from dress barn, who just retired, is now Masuda's advocate. And what he does is try to bring her knowledge, rather than she'll ask for something, he'll go find it, uh, and they'll have a discussion rather than how you're doing coaching kind of thing, which, which hasn't worked. So, but relationships are long lasting throughout the organization. We, you know, in the beginning, we only had a small group of Afghan women. The relationships were very intimate. Um, and we've moved away from that, not intentionally, but as we've scaled, they're not as intimate, but we still know all their names. We're still invited to their weddings. Um, we know when they have kids. We get the pictures. So it's not a day-to-day -day kind of thing, but it's a large, large extended family. And I get very teary-eyed when I talk about that because one of the things I haven't mentioned is that one of our first fast runners was a, um, a young mom by the name of Bak Nazira. She was a $50 a month school teacher when we met her. Um, she has four children. She couldn't afford to send the daughters to school. Only the son went to school. Uh, fast forward six years later. Her husband is now in our program. He has started a jewelry business because he was inspired. He was always supportive. He's a very unusual Afghan man. In those days, he was very supportive of his, his wife in business. Um, and, and by the way, through self-selection, because the women who are in business obviously have the support of their male family members. So we, we don't really deal with those kinds of issues, because by the time they come to us, they've already gone through any of those issues. But Hanaga used to help out his wife in fashion and saw that the women, uh, his wife's customers, were asking for matching jewelry. So he saw a market opportunity and started producing um, Afghan jewelry with a modern twist. So, and then he entered our program because of that. He's here in the US now. His jewelry is actually, um, offered on the Home Shopping Network. He, uh, and if you want to have a trunk show down here, we can certainly do that. Um, but what's interesting is he made a side trip to Albany the other day because his oldest daughter will be spending a semester at a high school in Albany. And because one of our members helped make that happen. So that's what I mean. It's really the relationships are so solid and long lasting. And, I say to one of my members, oh, you know, when I retire, I want to be sitting on the porch in a rocking chair and saying to you, hey, Bak Nazir is coming over with the kids and the husband next week on our private jet. And my, my member says, oh, that's such a waste of fuel. Tell her to fly commercial. <laughs> so. Well, Tony, thank you so much for coming to Little Rock. Thank you.